Today we're going to be talking about the Asian financial crisis. Now you've probably heard about it in your classes in school, but are you really familiar with what went down during that time period? The Asian financial crisis, also known as the Asian contagion, refers to the sequence of currency devaluations back in 1997 that affected a great number of Asian markets. Affected nations included Thailand, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the Philippines. The crisis had severe macroeconomic level effects, sharp dips in currency values, fluctuation of stock market, and change in asset prices. As a result of this financial crisis, many businesses failed and collapsed, and millions of citizens fell below the poverty line from 1997 to 1998. So what's the story behind the Asian financial crisis? What were the events that triggered the crisis? What brought about the dip in currency valuations? What were the repercussions of the crisis on citizens? And most importantly, what were the lessons learned from the Asian financial crisis? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in today's video. So sit back and relax as we dive into the details of the 1997 Asian financial crisis. This is Business Explained. The 1997 Asian financial crisis can be traced to have begun in Thailand, quickly spreading to neighboring economies soon after. Prior to the financial crisis, the nations around that region had been going through a period of growth. This period of growth led to the growth of so-called tiger economies, or economies with impressive rapid growth rates accompanied by the heightening of citizen standard of living. This term was used to describe the booming economies in Asia. The four Asian tigers, or Asian dragons, were noted to be South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. These nations underwent rapid industrialization from the early 1960s to the 1990s, and they were able to maintain growth rates of roughly 7% a year. The crisis nearly crippled such tiger economies, leading their stock markets to plummet and their currencies lose their value by around 70%. Now, analysts have pointed out a myriad of causes behind the Asian financial crisis. Let's take a look at them. Generally speaking, the causes were related to the export-led growth of nations in that region. This required the government to closely cooperate with the manufacturers of export products, which included the pegging of the nation's currency to the U.S. dollar. This was meant to ensure that the exchange rate was favorable to all of those who were involved. However, in the late 1990s, the United States began to increase its interest rates to bring down U.S. inflationary pressures. The higher interest rates in the United States made Asia a less attractive place for moving hot money flows. With this reduced influx of hot money, Asian currencies began to dwindle. Governments across Asia had a difficult time keeping their exchange rates at a fixed level against the dollar. As we've discussed earlier, the crisis began in Thailand. At first, it was perceived to be a currency crisis when the Thai government decided to stop pegging the Thai baht to the US dollar. Thailand had been going through what is now seen as an asset bubble that was being run by hot money. Asset bubbles occur when assets suddenly and drastically rise in price even though the value of the asset does not fall in line with its sudden increase in value. The bubble grew and grew, and more money needed to be put into it to keep it alive. However, it was not only Thailand that was going through such a bubble. Malaysia and Indonesia were in an economic bubble too. However, the situation in Malaysia and Indonesia were exacerbated by crony capitalism, or the phenomenon when the success of businesses is dependent on the relationship between business people and government officials. Now, Thailand, South Korea, and Indonesia all had deficits in their private current accounts. They also highly encouraged external borrowing due to the fixed exchange rates, which led to the high foreign exchange risk. When Thailand had unpegged their currency from the United States, other currencies devalued. During the first six months of the crisis, the Indonesian rupiah went down by 80%, the Thai baht went down by over 50%. The South Korean won went down by roughly 50%, and the Malaysian ringgit went down by 45%. The most affected economies experienced a dip in capital inflows, amounting to over $100 billion during the crisis's first year. It soon spread to both the Russian and Brazilian economies, later classifying the financial crisis as a global financial crisis. 
A lot of economists believe that the crisis was created by policies that negatively altered the incentives between lenders and borrowers. These pushed up asset prices too high and they soon began to collapse. As it could no longer be sustained, individuals and companies alike opted to default on their debt obligations. So how was the Asian financial crisis abated? Well, it was ultimately solved by the International Monetary Fund, which helped bail out nations that needed funds to stabilize their economies. The IMF committed to lending $110 billion in short-term loans to Indonesia, Thailand, and South Korea in an effort to help make their economies more stable. It was reportedly more than double the largest loan the IMF has ever given out. However, the IMF had several conditions for their massive loan. Increase in taxation, reduced public spending, higher interest rates, and privatization of state-owned businesses needed to be implemented to temper the economy. Many of the countries that were affected by the financial crisis showed signs of recovery by 1999. Now, what were the lessons learned from the crisis? In an article by Barry Sterling for Brookings, he wrote about the implications of the Asian financial crisis effects roughly 20 years later and pointed out how governments and institutions have grown and developed in an effort to prevent such a thing from happening again. This is what he had to say. The countries involved in this crisis have responded by improving their economic frameworks. Financial oversight, macroeconomic frameworks, and domestic competitiveness have been greatly strengthened. As a result, the region has experienced solid growth in the intervening period and proved resilient in the global financial. The region has also developed stronger collective institutions. The crisis gave impetus to efforts to become less reliant on the International Monetary Fund due to profound mistakes made in its response to the crisis. He also points out how the IMF was able to learn from the crisis. They saw the stark contrast between conventional macroeconomic crisis due to weakened macroeconomic policy and financial crisis and how failing institutions needed help and support to bounce back. The crisis also highlighted the need for programs focused on recovery should such situations arise. What are your thoughts on the Asian financial crisis? Do you think something like it could ever happen again? What might be a way to prevent this from ever happening again? Let me know about what you think in the comments section below. I'll be responding to all of you who comment within the first hour of me posting this video. If you enjoyed this video, you should definitely check out my other video called AAPL, How Apple Stocks Compare to Competitors. There are still many industries still undergoing the recovery period from the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, but it seems that major tech companies are leading the pack in terms of bouncing back and staying afloat during these tough times. Today, we're going to be talking about one such big tech company. In fact, it's one of the biggest consumer tech companies in the world today. You've guessed it, we're going to be talking about Apple and how its stocks are faring in such a tumultuous business environment. In spite of the global pandemic, it seems that Apple had a pretty good year. In fact, compared to other smartphone companies and manufacturers, Apple has been far less negatively impacted by lockdowns and community quarantine periods implemented across the globe. Just in September, it was reported that Apple share jumped way up high after it released its second quarter earnings. The company rose to a market cap of over a whopping $2 trillion. However, a lot of investors are still thinking of whether or not Apple stock should be bought. How has Apple stock been faring recently? How is Apple doing for its fourth quarter? And how does its performance compare to that of its key competitors? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be diving into in that video. So check it out and see for yourself how Apple stocks are doing. Stay tuned, stay educated.